Cannon Rocks, South Africa, is said to have taken its name from two cannons that have been found along the stretch of beach it lays on. Both cannons are obviously the result of shipwrecks. It is supposed that at least one of these cannons most likely came from the wreck of the Portuguese ship, the São João Baptista. The ever-shifting sands in the area show and then hide hints of the 1600s ship, but it is not likely there is much left. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the long walk from São João Baptista? Here we are. Enjoy! On March 1, 1622, the São João Baptista, under the command of Captain Pedro de Moraes Sarmento, departed Goa with a cargo of Chinese porcelain, fine cloth, carpets, pepper, and a packet of diamonds. The São João Baptista was a new ship, having just been built in Goa, and this would be her first voyage to Portugal. She did not sail alone. She was in the company of the flagship, the Nossa Senhora do Paraiso. Almost as soon as the voyage began, the São João Baptista began to have difficulties. About 15 days from their departure from Goa, it was found that she had taken on a good deal of water due to a previously undiscovered leak, and lowering the water was no easy task. Her pumps had been built for a small galleon, and though it had been thought they had been rebuilt to suit the much larger now, it was discovered that only one of them was usable, and the rest of the water had to be removed by the crew using buckets and barrels. They still managed to remain in company with the Nossa Senora do Paraiso, in spite of these conditions, until the 17th of July, when, during the night, the São João Baptista lost sight of the lights of the flagship and when the next morning came, they were no longer able to see her. Now alone, the São João Baptista's luck did not improve. On the morning of the 19th of July, two Dutch ships were spotted right ahead of her. As the two Dutch ships, the Mauritius and the Wappen van Rotterdam, approached, it was clear that the São João Baptista, which was over-encumbered, had no chance of escape. It was going to have to be a fight. It was a fight that the São João Baptista was ill-equipped for. She had cannons, but only 18, and these were small caliber. Not only that, but her supply of gunpowder was also very small. She was intended as a cargo ship through and through. Still, she held her own against all odds for 19 days in a running battle between the three ships. For the first two days of the battle, it seemed as though the São João Baptista was going to quickly fall. Twenty of the people on the Portuguese ship fell victim to the fight in this time. But then someone thought of the chests of Liberty Goods on board. Liberty goods were the goods allowed to the officers of the ship to carry cargo that they could sell to their own benefit. Since these chests were all of a mandated size, they were good building materials which were used to fashion bulwarks on the ship. This saved lives, but it did not do much to protect the ship from the cannon fire of the two Dutch ships, and the São João Baptista was reduced to a state where she was in clear and obvious danger of sinking. The bowsprit mainmast, and foresail were all shot away. The rudder, which had been salvaged from a ship that had been broken up in Goa and then allowed to rot on the beach two years before being put into service on the São João Baptista, was so weak and fragile that it shattered after two shots struck it. The bolt holes from the rudder being ripped away now began to allow the ship to once again take on water and the people on board were forced to bail her again. The Dutch had also not kept their shots to only above the waterline, and these holes also contributed to a swiftly sinking ship. 
two people were sent over from the São João Baptista as emissaries to try to gain some time to mend the holes in their ship. But a storm blew in, and no one was sure where they, or the Dutch ship they had been on, went. The other ships sent emissaries of their own to the São João Baptista to inquire if they knew where the other ship had gone. But on getting a negative, the Dutch returned to their ship without any further talks of peace. The São João Baptista also had the weather to contend with. It was bitter cold, there was frequently rough weather, and it often snowed. Due to the rough weather, it was impossible to light fires on the ship, so they were not able to gain heat this way. The main people to suffer under these conditions were the enslaved people aboard who had been put to work bailing and repairing the ship, and as they fell, the crew and passengers took their place. They made a jury mast out of the mizzen mast, and without a rudder, allowed the winds to take them wherever they could go. The entire time, the remaining Dutch ship chasing after them. It was their hope that the wind would carry them to land, since their ship was still in a sinking condition, but the wind failed to oblige for multiple days, until they struck their sail one night and hoped the waves would do what the wind did not. This unexpected action allowed them to slip away from the Dutch ship that had been following them. In the darkness, the Dutch ship assumed that the Portuguese ship had headed back out to sea, whereas they had actually finally headed towards land. In the morning, the Dutch ship was no longer in sight. The two Dutch ships were in terrible condition by the time they reached the Sunda Strait, and both ships had lost most of their crews, though the reason was not specified. It is certainly possible that this was a factor in the lengthy sea battle. It seems that while the São João Baptista had its problems, the Mauritius and the Wappen van Rotterdam had problems of their own. Francisco Vaz d'Almeida, one of the passengers on the São João Baptista, had been a captain at one time in his own right, in addition to being a nobleman and a soldier. He would later write an account of the events, which is not entirely kind to Captain Pedro de Moray at this moment. He admits that he was a brave man, but he also refers to him as inexperienced and unwilling to seek the advice of people with more experience. While many people who were more experienced than he was thought that the best option was to create sweeps to steer the rudderless ship, the captain instead decided to fashion a makeshift rudder using pieces of the ship's castles to do so. They managed to make it, but though they hung it from the stern with ropes waiting for a calm day to attach it, a calm day never came. It eventually fell into the sea, never having been used, to the relief of many on board who heard it beating against the stern with every wave and worried that it would do even more damage to the already damaged ship. With the would-be rudder gone, the suggestion of making sweeps was now adopted, using even more portions of the remaining castles and masts of the ship. There were very few pieces of the ship's castles left in any case, since the fight with the Dutch had decimated them. This left nails and splinters of wood sticking out of the decking where pieces of ship had been removed. And these had to be quickly removed since passengers were being injured on them when the ship pitched in the still rough waves. With the aid of the sweeps, and the wind finally turning to a favorable direction, the Sao Joao approached the shore at long last. Afraid to lose land again, the ship was anchored, and a group went to scout out a good landing place. While they were still trying to decide their next course of action, trouble arose on board the ship. On the passing of the master boson, the boson mate, Manuel Dominguez, was promoted to his place, which proved to be a mistake. Almost as soon as he was promoted, he was described as becoming arrogant and starting arguments with almost everyone he met, though many of the sailors were on his side. After they anchored the ship, the boatswain approached the captain and told him that he had chosen 30 men, and that the next day he expected the captain to get into a boat with them and all of the jewels. It was the boatswain's belief that this small party, carrying all the weapons they had and the jewels, 
had a much higher chance of reaching Cape Corrientes than if they tried to bring with them all of the women and children on board. Instead, he proposed to abandon them. The captain immediately refused, calling it an evil plan. But the boatswain said that if he did not agree, they would seize him and place him in the boat. Fearing that they would follow through with their plan, especially after a few days had passed and it became clear that the sailors were on the boatswain's side, the captain decided to end the argument once and for all with a knife, ending the life of the boatswain, and at the same time, ensuring that the women and children were not going to be abandoned. Though the captain had not agreed, it was not an unheard-of proposal in Portuguese shipwreck narratives of the time. Indeed, when the São Paulo wrecked in 1560, a group of sailors suggested doing away with women and children, and also cursed the people who had allowed them to get on board the ship in Portugal. They then began to start unloading the São João Baptista, though the rough shore and continued poor weather did not make this task easy, and at one point one of the boats capsized and 18 men were lost. This decided the matter on how they're going to attempt to make it to Mozambique. The seas were too rough to travel by boat. They were going to have to travel over land. The locals soon appeared, and the people who landed from the São João Baptista, 279 in total, quickly formed a trade partnership with them. In total, the group would spend a month and six days on the beach, living in shelters and a church that they had built from the fine drapery, carpets, and cloth that had been part of the cargo of the São João Baptista. When it was decided that the ship was beyond repair, and there was no chance of safety launching a boat if they did build a new one, the captain ordered that the São João Baptista should be burned, so that they could salvage the nails for trade purposes. and. Also, so that they could prevent the locals from salvaging anything from it and making their trade prices go up. With the ship burned and the diamonds and metals in their packs, the group set out on November 6th from their camp. It was quite the procession, with 17 oxen loaded with provisions and trade goods and five litters on which were carried some of the women and the wounded. Shortly after departing, however, they were attacked by a group that stole the oxen that were carrying their provisions. This caused a terrible hunger to plague their journey from the start. The group did their best to find food as they walked, though some of these experiments proved to make them sick rather than ease their hunger, since they did not know much about what was and was not edible in the area. With the group getting weaker by the day, the captain began to allow people to lighten their load, starting with the musk, which was thrown into a river they crossed. Still, not all was harmonious in the group. At one point, allegations about theft of some of the diamonds caused an execution that the others criticized the captain for, saying that not enough evidence had been gathered and that there was a good chance the man was innocent. They also turned on a guide they had hired from among the locals, fearing betrayal, and deciding to strike first an act that also made some of the group unhappy. It was becoming clear that the group was anything but a cohesive one. They abandoned one young woman when no one was willing to carry her litter any longer, even though the noblewomen of the group were still being carried for some time. They continued to supplement their diet with what they could find, either along the seashore or hunting. They also found groups of people who they could trade with, but their situation was dire. It was later admitted that they also consumed the members of their group who fell victim to starvation. Francisco Vaz d'Almeida was quick in his narrative to assure the reader that he never ate anyone. But he also admits that he had the best gun and was an experienced hunter, and also that he hid what he was able to hunt from the majority of the people he was traveling with people had begun to drop from hunger in great numbers, and those who remained finally announced that they could no longer carry the litters, not for any promised sum of money. The women and the ill were told that those who could walk 
would need to, to keep up or be left behind. While those who could not walk would be left in a fishing village they were camped near. They could no longer afford to be slowed down. It was a painful parting the next day, as families separated, or refused to do so as they had decided amongst themselves. The people who were to remain in the fishing village were given some trade goods to support themselves, and the group departed, though they did bring the youngest child of Beatriz Alvarez with them, though she remained with her other three children in the fishing village. She did not consent to this but the group became concerned about an entire generation of a noble family being in danger in a single place. As they walked further, they had better luck with trade, and the group managed to continue their journey, but food was a constant matter of contention. It was clearly on the mind of the captain, who meted out capital punishment to any who was found to have stolen even a small piece of meat or taken a trade item they were not supposed to have in order to trade for food. His harshness was criticized more and more by members of the group who thought that he was going too far. Food would soon be on the forefront of everyone's minds again, as wherever they traveled they seemed to have an equal chance between finding trade partners or being robbed during the night. The Portuguese began to deal with such robbery harshly, in the hope that word would spread and it would prevent future attacks, but this was not always the case. A part of the hostility that they were met with might have been in part because word had spread, at least in some places, that they ate men. What follows is primarily a litany of people who were left behind along the road, starvation, fights, and trades. Francisco Vaz d'Almeida is not skilled at recounting geography, and it makes it difficult to pinpoint their exact path of travel as they trudged towards Sofala, where they hoped to find help. Indeed, Francisco Vaz d'Almeida seems primarily focused on the telling of the portions of the story that place him in a good light and many of the other details are sketchy or brushed over. It makes for a story that is sometimes full of details, and at other points is unclear and inconsistent. It is therefore unfortunate that he is the only chronicler of the experiences of those who had been traveling on the São João Baptista. As they walked, people would also elect to remain in villages that they passed through, realizing that they had become too weak to continue. This eventually included the captain, who became so weak that for a while they carried him on a litter before he handed his power over to a committee headed by Francisco Vaz d'Almeida and was also left behind. By the time that they reached the Portuguese fortress at Sofala on July 28, 1623, a full eight months after they had started their trek, only a handful of their group remained. In total, they had walked over 870 miles of rough terrain, with many obstacles in their way. The account led by Francisco Vaz d'Almeida put the total number who traveled from Sofala to their final destination in Mozambique by a ship at 29. All of them were men. None of the women and children were still with them, and the survivors were all either nobles or members of the crew. From Mozambique, they were able to find a ship that returned them to Goa. The matter of the diamonds would be the most lasting legacy of the wreck as far as the government was concerned. Some of the diamonds would arrive with the survivors in Goa, and it would turn into a lengthy legal battle between the Portuguese government and the diamonds owners who should get them. The original owners eventually won. As for the final resting place of the São João Baptista, the location is not definite, but it is believed to be somewhere around Cannon Rocks. The mention of the cannons goes as far back as 1786, and with the absence of any other shipwrecks in the area before this other than the São João Baptista, it makes it an educated guess. 
shards of Chinese porcelain sometimes also wash ashore, a lasting legacy of the people who found themselves washed on the shore. For a complete translation of the account written by Francesco Vaz Delmeda, please see The Tragic History of the Sea, translated by C.R. Boxer, from the original Portuguese in 1959, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.